Today, we share a single mother's transformative journey from growing up in poverty to becoming one of the most passionate educators of financial independence. Here we go. Today, our guest is Jackie Cummings-Koski. She's a notable figure in the world of personal finance, especially in the context of financial independence. Koski authored Money Letters to My Daughter, a personal finance book aimed at imparting financial wisdom. Her journey is remarkable, overcoming a challenging childhood as the daughter of a single father in a family of six to retiring at 49 with a net worth of $1.3 million. She achieved this feat on a modest salary, never exceeding $80,000 per year. She did this through strategic financial planning and investments. Koski's story is not just about financial success, but also about empowering others, particularly in the Black community, to achieve financial independence. Welcome to the show, Jackie. Thanks, David. You're my old buddy. I'm glad to be on the show with you today. Yeah, I'm. Look, I'm loving the Tupac in the background. I'm vibing with that. All right. Keeps me. It keeps me in check over here. Yeah, yeah. Helps with the energy. You are a mover and shaker in the financial independence world. Your passion is personal finance and helping others. Can you walk us through your personal finance journey? Yeah. So um, you mentioned that you know I, I grew up in poverty in rural South Carolina. And I was raised by a single dad, and it was six of us. So we're growing up in this house, and, you know, this is a small ranch home. So it, it was tough. You know, I wore hand-me-downs, you know, in, in school. I was on the free lunch program. So it wasn't, um, you know, a childhood that was even close to middle class. We were in poverty. Uh, but my dad, he worked his butt off, and um, he passed on some really good, I guess, habits. You know, you don't have to be wealthy to have good financial habits. He had an amazing work ethic. He didn't really believe in debt. Um, But about two months before I graduated from high school, he got cancer and he passed away. So most of what I remember about him and learned from him was in my formidable years when I was under 18. So uh, one of the biggest things I did to try to make sure I would never be in poverty, I just wanted a good job. I just wanted to be middle class. So When uh, I decided to go off to college, I figured that would make a big difference and it would help me get a better job with good benefits because, you know, that's what I was taught growing up. So I went to college. Uh, During college, I did what my dad taught me to do, and that was work hard to pay for the things that that you had. So mine was tuition. And even though I got a few scholarships and uh, grants, I still had to work two jobs, sometimes 50 plus hours a week, just to make sure tuition was paid and all my other expenses. Um, and something had to give, and, and it was my grade. So I did horrible, horrible uh, in college, but I did manage to graduate. And that was what I was going for. So um, once I graduated, that it, it did help me to get a, a good job. It wasn't minimum wage. And I felt great about that. I ended up you know, getting married shortly after I graduated from high school. Um, I remember uh, I had my first job at a coll- high college was uh, working at Walmart headquarters in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. And I got married after I moved there. But then my husband and I ended up moving to Ohio. And as soon as I got to Ohio, I found out I was pregnant. So I had my daughter, uh, you know, we had the, you know, big happy family, you know, everything was great uh, for about 12 years. And then uh, I ended up getting a divorce. And so that changed the trajectory of everything. You know, what I thought was a shared journey ended up being a solo project that made me think about how do I make sure I'm not going to be in poverty again, that I'm going to be okay, that my daughter is going to be okay. So all those things are running through my head. And that was kind of the real pivotal moment that made me say, I need to, what do I, what can I do to make sure things are going to be okay for us? And, uh, you know, there were some things that happened um, at the time of, uh, you know, getting the divorce settled and everything that really stuck with me. But the main thing I got out of that was that I need to learn about finances. I need to make sure me and my daughter are going to be okay. And then I was, you know, off to that journey of just, I really had to start with basic financial literacy just to get going before I went to all of these, went through all of these other uh, phases. So, so that kind of, you know, got me started in the whole personal finance realm. How did your experiences as a single mother shape your approach to personal finance? Yeah, it, it was a bit different than what I was 
seeing, especially in the personal finance space or in the um, fire space, financial independence, retire early. Because, you know, a lot of the people and the well-known names, the things in the media was, you know, two high earning adults that were in tech or engineer or whatever, or, you know, single person that didn't have kids. So for me, um, now I, I was able to take away a few things from from people that shared their story and I always appreciated it. But I knew for me as a single mom, I had to think about, you know, what were my superpowers? What were things that were helpful? And it just started with, you know, just learning about, you know, personal finance, things like knowing about my 401k and why that was why it was important to invest in that. What what the stock market was, um, what could I expect to you know, for my money to do when it was invested. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things was trying to make sure that what I was learning was also passed on to my daughter. And, you know, at the time, my top priorities was having a good steady job to pay her bills and to be able to still have time to spend with my daughter. Those were the main priorities. So, I wasn't trying to climb the corporate ladder, you know, I wasn't trying to work the side job and things like that. I just tried to focus on doing more with the money that I had, because that meant that I at least had a little bit more time to to spend with my daughter. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? You know, what did it look like to do more with the money that you had? And you mentioned you had some superpowers. So how did you optimize those superpowers? Yeah, well, so for me, so at the, I mentioned at the time of my divorce, Um, that really woke me up. And the most memorable thing was when we looked at the 401k accounts, our retirement accounts. So basically what happens is all the money goes into one pile and you split it down the money middle. And we didn't really have a whole lot. Like the house, there was probably no equity in the house. We didn't have much of anything else. So it was the 401ks. And when I looked at my 401k balance at the time of the divorce, it was $20,000. Now I'm in my 30s at the time. His 401k was $120,000. So there was a $100,000 disparity. So that was the big light bulb for me. That I, I felt so financially ignorant when I saw that. So um, I said, that's when I really said I need to get this together. And one of the first things I did, I thought about, you know, what did I want to do? What did I like? Because now, you know, my daughter's with her dad every other weekend. So I have that time at least that I can do something that, I enjoy. And that that's kind of a hard question to ask yourself, you know, when you're so used to doing everything with your family. So I was very interested in the stock market, which is kind of a different place to start learning about money and personal finance. But that was sort of the starting point for me. And so much of this per- personal finance stuff is intertwined. So once you find one thread, it all kind of comes back together. So I found an investment club um, and it was part of a nonprofit organization called Better Investing. And I was talking to a friend of mine at work and she said, oh, um, I'm a part of this organization. I'm sure there's one in your area. You should Google it. So I started um, observing the the investment club. I, I thought it was pretty cool because they were talking about, you know, individual companies and leadership and the growth and revenue and all these cool things. That I, and they were just so smart. And I ended up joining that investment club. And, and yeah, we pulled money and things like that, but it was mostly about education. And I finally learned that you can't save your way to wealth. You have to grow it through investing. And so as I'm learning about investing in the stock market, the light bulbs start going off. So I'm thinking, why am I not maxing out my 401k? Why am I not maxing out my Roth IRA? Why am I not maxing out my health savings account? I could invest in my health savings account. So even though I wasn't making a huge amount of money, if I was putting money in these tax advantage accounts, the traditional at least would allow me to reduce my taxable income. I got to file head of household and I I wasn't afraid of the stock market anymore before I was, and I didn't even know what I was doing. So now with the money that I had, I'm investing it and it's growing and I'm feeling pretty good about it. And at, I was I was 38 before I did my first net worth statement, but that was very empowering to me. That's like the most powerful exercise I'd ever done around my money and finances. And seeing your net worth grow 
whether it's through paying down debt, getting more equity in your home, or your investment investments making more money, or you putting more money to work, it's just very powerful to see that you are moving the needle, that you are making a difference. So, so those are some of the things that um, I kind of felt was definitely to my advantage. About how much time passed between you discovering that you wanted to make a change or wanted to learn, and then you actually feeling comfortable with your financial knowledge and and what that net worth trend was looking like. Yeah. So let's look at the timeline. So I got divorced around 2003, 2004. My daughter was about nine years old at the time. And, you know, for anyone that's gone through a divorce, you know, David, I know you have to, uh, it, you know, it, it could be devastating, you know, not only on your finances, but emotionally. And you're trying to pull it all together because you're making this big life shift now, especially if you have a kid. And I had a kid. So it took me about two years to really get to the place where I was ready to start doing something. That's why I never minimize or overlook the emotional and the psychological side of your money. Nothing was going to happen until I got my head right and, and I worked out the mindset. So that's when I joined the investment club. And I would say I was in the invest. So I joined the investment club around 2007. Okay. And that turned out to be a pretty good time because I was just getting started. So then 2008 hit, and that's when I really started doing my heavy lifting. At that point, I think that's when I started investing in all the accounts. And the one account that I had no idea that I could even invest in initially was that health savings account. And I, that's one thing I call my superpower, just because um, me and my daughter, it worked great for us. It's not for everybody, but we're on a high deductible health plan because we're very low consumers of health care. Um, we went for our wellness visits every year, and that was about it. And so I decided I wanted to use that money for long term. So I would max out the family max every year, and it was invested in just like a total stock market um, index fund. So, so this is 2008, and a lot of my net worth growth was attributed to how well the market did from 2008 on. So you got 2008. 2009, 2010, you go all the way up to um, my daughter graduated from college in 2013. So that's when I saw the biggest lift. Now, I didn't fully reach financial independence or retire until maybe around 2016. Um, so I continued with that growing. And here was the, the pivotal uh, moment with the finances and the net worth growth was that when I was earning more money on my investments than I was bringing home with my paycheck, that was that was huge for me to say, oh my gosh, my money is just sitting here. You know, I had it invested, of course, in the stock market, but that's growing way faster than the paycheck I'm bringing home. So then I started, you know, organizing things a little bit better to make some projections to say, hmm, Maybe I can step away a little bit early or how soon will I be able to get to a million dollars or to get to my fire number? So all the all the bells and whistles, you know, started going off for me at that point. I love that you talked about how you don't ignore the psychological part of money because there are so many things going on. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, it's different. You hear all these stories, but as a single parent, it's different. What advice would you give to single parents? Like what makes it unique and what are those challenges that they might be facing? Yeah, thank you so much, Dusty, for asking that question. I never get asked that question, but it's so important and it is very different. You don't have that second parent to sort of co-sign on what you're doing. So even aside from the money part of it, it's the dynamics with your kid. You know, typically if you've got both parents, you're both kind of uh, standing together. And when you divorce, you don't always agree on things. And, you know, the kid is in two households and all that. Um, so raising one kid, um, it, it, it was just hard to juggle work and take care of her and know that everything was on me. Like in a lot of, you know, marriages or if you've got the family and the household together, and of course I had this for 12 years, but you're able to divide and conquer. You can split responsibilities. Um, so for instance, you know, my husband, he was one that mowed the lawn and took care of things around the house. And I did, you know, the other things, maybe more of the inside stuff. Well, now that it's just me, I either have to mow the lawn myself 
or I have to pay somebody to do it. So every decision was all on me. And, you know, depending on how you look at it, you know, that's a double-edged sword, right? Everything that goes wrong is because of me. Everything that goes right is because of me. So you can't, you don't have that other person to sort of, um, you know, either blame them or whatever. Um, so that was always hard. Just wondering if I did the right thing. And, and, and I'll say this too, you know, growing up in poverty and a lot of what I was exposed to was a lot of single parents, divorce and things like that. And for me, it was really a big deal to, you know, have a nice family unit for my daughter. I wanted that because I didn't really see that growing up. So I wanted to give her the two-parent household and a happy family, but that's not how it always works out. And it's that's not a decision only you can make. You know, you've got two people in that picture. So I I, I didn't like that I wasn't able to give that to her her entire childhood. Now, since then, you know, we've evolved and she's grown up. She's in her 20s now. You start to understand that, you know, not every situation works out. And um you know, I hated that I didn't give that to her, but I gave her everything else that I could give her. And I know that she she sees that now as a 20 something year old kind of, you know, the struggle that I had trying to d- juggle so much and juggling so much by myself. So. um, So, yeah, I, I appreciate that question because there was definitely some challenges that, um, you know, you don't have to worry as much about, you know, when you are, you know, married and, you know, got your kid together and, and everything's like one big happy family. You can definitely hear your passion and your voice for not only personal finance knowledge, but the impact that it can have on an individual. And your and you've already expressed what that impact is in your life. How did you transition from personal finance being personal to you to advocating personal finance beyond just your family? And not only just to the greater masses, but uh, within the black community. Yeah. um, For me, of of course, as a mom, you know, as soon as we learn something, we want to share it with our kids. So that was number one. And that's when, you know, I wrote the book, uh, Money Letters to My Daughter. Um, You know, part of my program in college was uh, journalism. So that was one of my outlets. And when I saw it was, you know, fairly easy to get a book published yourself um, at that time. Uh, I spent the time to write down everything that I had learned. Um, I tried to make it as entertaining as possible because my daughter was a teenager at the time. I think she was uh, 14. And I just wanted to give her this book as her high school graduation gift. So all the things I learned, I just put it in these little letters. And I wanted them to be fun and lighthearted. And I wanted the, them to be to the point and easy to understand. So once that book was published, give it to my daughter as a gift, there was a lot of schools that was asking me to come in and talk to their classes. And then I went to every high school in the school district that I grew up in. And I'm like, wow, they're interested in this, interested in having me. And so I turned it into a presentation. I started giving out these $2 bills. And, you know, that was one of the ways that I learned how to save money. I just started collecting $2 bills when I was in high school and and, and for years. So when I started with high school kids, what that told me was that they were interested in learning as long as you made it entertaining. And in most cases, they weren't getting that entertainment. You know, the teachers are working their butts off, so they're happy to have me in just to give them a break. And the kids were like, yay, we have some fun. We're going to get some money. You know, um, I never saw a $2 bill or everybody's got a $2 bill story, right? Um, their grandpa gave them one or they think it's lucky. And so I love to see their eyes light up. I love to see them make the connection because I was somehow able to explain something in a very simple way. And the best part about it with high school and college kids is that they have so much time to get it right. And the reason why I started like going back to my old high school and my old um, school district in my area and my city is because I knew that there were so many other people that grew up in poverty just like I did, and they may not have gotten exposed to the things that I was exposed to or the education. You know, I went digging because I had this crazy curiosity about money, but not everybody's going to do that. So I started thinking, I figured, okay, if me, a little black girl that grew up in poverty in the South, got a little bit of financial literacy, made it to financial independence, retired early, 
there's a lot of other people that can do that. I'm, I don't see myself as all that special. And I believe in the messenger. You know, the, when it comes to personal finance, we know what the big areas are. We know what the formula is, but who's bringing the message and who is exposed to that message? So it was so important to me to um, get this message and this knowledge as much as I can to people that look like me because I'm so familiar with that experience. I mean, I, I remember I went to this one high school and they wanted me to talk to the whole, in an, an assembly to the whole school. And I just start out saying, and I knew this was a Title I school. A Title I school is where the majority of the students is on some kind of, um, you know, social services and things like that, you know, like uh, on the free lunch program too, like I was. So I will start out saying, you know, everybody in this room is probably doing better than me when I was in high school. I was raised by a single dad with six kids and we were in poverty. We were on the free lunch program. I got hand-me-down clothes and it was rough. So you guys are probably all doing better than I did growing up. But doing a few things right and learning a few things about money and personal finance, it made all the difference. Because I want you to follow your dreams. And I see that the money always being the obstacle that keeps you from following your dreams. That's how I see it. Money is kind of that tool or that, that, that um, you know, disruptor or that roadblock that slows you down from doing the things that you really love. And so I just started that way. And I think immediately they're disarmed. They're like, this girl is just like me. She gets it. Um, And I want their minds to kind of be open that just because you're here now in poverty, like I was, it doesn't have to stay that way. But, you know, when you are trying to get in a better place, you don't know what you don't know. So I, I just hear a lot of people that will say, um, this information is out there for everybody. Anybody could get it. We're all on equal footing. Well, not really. You know, if you're not exposed to it and you don't know what you don't know, there's nobody around you even talking about it. You're not working um, at corporate America or with maybe other people that might could share this with you. So they're not getting it because they don't know it or they don't know where to get it. They don't know what they need. Or worse, they're getting it from uh, TikTokers who shove yeah. like very pointed tidbits of very limited financial knowledge uh, and to people who just see it in their in their feed yeah. like invest in crypto right. or this this strategy or that strategy and it's completely even if there is some accuracy to it it's it's not the whole story it's just in right. a 30 second clip I want to camp on two things that you said I just want to make sure that the audience heard a couple of things that you said and heard them loud and clear one is the messenger right? Like everyone needs this message. And a lot of times it's not being delivered because we're told not to talk about money. Money is awkward. It's uncomfortable. So you need to be a messenger. Anyone that's listening to this, you can be a messenger. You can start that conversation. And yeah, you do want to see somebody that looks like you, that has similar experiences that can relate because that's how you know that it's possible. That's how you know that you can maybe do it. And I also, I love to say this, but the messenger matters in terms of you hear the message differently from different people. So I can look at you, Jackie, and I can hear it loud and clear. And if David tells me the same thing, I might be like, mm, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe not. That's how she responds to everything I say. Uh, <laughs> but also, you know, you think about that in your real life. If your parent tells you something or your sibling, that's different than if you see someone else that you like, respect, trust, have a different relationship with. So I want to camp on that. And then the other thing that I love, and I don't think we think about this enough, is you don't know what you don't know, and also you don't know what you know. So if you've grown up in poverty and that is what you know, you need someone else to open up that door. If you, you know, I grew up with a cash envelope system. My mom always had cash in an envelope for groceries and she had a calculator and that's how we went to the store. I just thought that's how you budgeted. I had no idea that there was another way until someone showed me that, yes, hey, the, things can be different. So I really want to make sure that, you know, if you are going to go out there and be the messenger, you have to think about what someone might know, what's normal to them and how that's different than what's normal to you so that you can have that story. You know, because like talking to you, Jackie, I wrote down so many things about what is it like for my single friends that are parents? 
what are they dealing with? How are they teaching their kids? Could I connect them to you so that they have an idea? And also, what are what are the pivotal moments that have made a difference in my life? And then how can you pay that forward? Because you were talking about that pivotal moment where you saw how much your ex-husband had in his retirement account versus you. And then that's this aha moment. And that's what makes you take action. You're talking to high schoolers. They're in those pivotal moments where they're like, oh, you know, I can't wait to get out of here. Or what's next? Or you know, what is that thing? So I love those lessons that that you've been share, sharing with us. Yeah, I I like when you mentioned like the high schoolers and like where they're at. Um, and it reminds me, I, I worked th- with this one high school locally and the teacher, her name is Miss White. Uh, I go in there a couple of times a year and talk about personal finance or we play, ga- you know, I don't even say talk about personal finance. We play games about money and we talk about, you know, anything that's on their mind and I'll have a little prepared thing and of course give away a bunch of $2 bills. But so I'm going in there next week and we're texting back and forth and texting back and forth with Miss White. And she was like, yeah, I really want you to come in. And, and, and the classes that she is over, these are like, credit recovery classes where they don't have enough credits to graduate. So they're trying to catch up. So she was texting me. She's like, yeah, they, I really need you to come in. They want to talk about investing because they're all uh, trading on cash app. (laughs) Okay. Which is totally fine. Okay. Cause that's something, right? So here's the thing. You, you got to meet them where they're at. I can't go in there and start talking about budgeting when their minds is on trading on Cash App. So that's where I'm going to start. And like I said, all this stuff is intertwined. I can get them back to the budgeting. I could get them back to, well, where do you get the money to invest in Cash App? Can you show me what you're investing? Like you have to be interested. It's like to me, let's say if someone is, you know, investing in crypto or something we think is crazy. I learned that you can't totally discount that because you're giving up an opportunity to have a good conversation with, <clears throat> excuse me, with that kid. So you might not be supporting what they're doing, but they're talking about money. They're willing to be open about it. So engage in the conversation and maybe ask them some questions. And that, and that way you get them thinking. And the worst that could happen to a kid that's investing on Cash App or in crypto, whatever, you know what? They can't be making so much money. They, if they're talking about investing in um, crypto and cash app, you know how much money they probably have? A couple hundred dollars. Okay, so what's the worst case? They lose a couple hundred dollars. Okay, it's an 18-year-old. They lose $200. So what? Th- usually there's a big lesson in that. And it's better that they learn when it's $200 than $200,000. So I engage in those conversations about money no matter where they're at because I can bring it full circle and start to have a really, really productive dialogue with them because there's so many areas of investing that tie back to general personal finance. So. What is your most uh, notable success story from you being an advocate, whether it be an individual or a group? So this is going to be kind of funny. Um, so this is an individual. And, you know, sometimes I do little media appearances, whatever. I don't know how they even find me because I'm not even that active on social media. But I, I did get a pretty big one la- uh, a couple years ago um, on the Rachel Ray Show. So it was this producer that had reached out to me. Um, I think her name was Rebecca. And she wanted, she said, yeah, we've always wanted to do a segment on investing. And we just like the way you explain things. So either they got my book or they saw something on social media or one of my videos or whatever. So as I'm talking to her and we're trying to lay something out, um, she was wanted to talk about 401ks and what you're investing in. And, and as I'm preparing for this interview set up with her, we get done. And I'll say, well, have you checked your 401k? Like, do you know what's in your 401k? And we started talking about her 401k. <laughs> and um, the next time we talk, oh, you know what? She emailed me the very next day. She went into her 401k and she looked at her investments to make sure she knew what she invested in. She made some changes based on what her goals were. You know, I wasn't giving her advice or anything, just giving her enough curiosity about her own finances, because no matter who you're dealing with in life, they money touches everybody. So if I'm talking to a reporter, a writer, interviewer, anyone, they got finances too. So if we're talking about it, I'm always going to take the extra step and ask them how things are going for them. <laughs> I love that. I think that that's what this is all about, right? Is meeting people where they are, 
having those conversations, pulling the thread just a little bit further. All right, Jackie, well, thank you so much for everything that you do as far as one, being a good friend. Uh, It's always great to talk to you, whether it's in a face-to-face or via podcast or via telephone. Uh, You've always got a very bright, positive energy, and I know that helps you send your message. And for that, I appreciate you. And thank you so much for being here on the show. All right, David, it was my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you all for listening.